Well, good morning. My name is Dan Slagle. I serve as the care and missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. Let me add my welcome to that of others who've been up here this morning. So glad you've chosen to worship with us today. We're continuing our sermon series, God is Calling. And we're going to be in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep if you do not presently own one. God is calling. We've been looking at the notion of God's call upon our lives. What does that mean and how is it made manifest in our lives? When it comes to God's call, I, we can think about it on two different levels. On the first level is the call of God that is extended to every single person on the planet, everyone. A very general call to all persons to enter into a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the general call of God that goes out to all persons. But going a, a level deeper, there is also a call that comes to those who have responded to the general call, who have entered into that relationship. And this call has to do with purpose. God wants to reveal to us why he made us, why he put us here. He wants to infuse our lives with meaning. He wants us to understand we're not accidents of history or biology. No, we're, we're here on purpose. God intentionally put us here. He's got things that he wants us to do. He's got a person that he wants us to become. Uh, l last week, uh, Pastor Ken uh, helped us begin to understand how to receive that call. And our role model in receiving a call from God is Moses. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Moses, you haven't read his story in Exodus or you haven't seen the Ten Commandments uh, on TV, either one, uh, Moses was a man that God raised up for a special purpose, and that was to liberate the Israelites from their captivity to the Egyptians. The Israelite people had been in captivity for 400 years. They were slaves. God heard their cries for freedom and raised up this man, Moses, and sent him with the task of setting his people free. And Pastor Ken helped us understand that when we receive God's call, there's a, a, a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And the wrong way is to try to make God's call fit our agenda. We move forward on, on our time frame and according to our plans, and we try to make something happen the way we think it ought to happen. But rarely, if ever, does that succeed. On the other hand, when we are willing to receive God's call uh, in the right way, at the right time, and in the right spirit, we have greatly increased the odds of success because we are operating according to God's plan, according to God's schedule, how he would go about implementing this call. We're going to pick up today where Pastor Ken left off, and we're going to talk about what comes after we have received the call. When the call has been made clear, and we have received it in the right way and at the right time and in the right spirit, what then? What then, in a word, is challenge. Every call brings with it a challenge. The two always go together. And what we want to learn from the life of Moses today is how do we deal with those challenges? We've heard this call, we've responded to this call, we want to do what God has called us to do, but what about when things get difficult? How do we remain faithful? How do we keep our hands on the plow, not look back, not quit? In order to do that, we're going to learn from the life of Moses that there are three things that we need. Uh, there is something that we need, first of all, to understand. 
There is, secondly, something that we need to do. And then finally, there is something that we need to believe. Something to understand, something to do, and something to believe. The three needs in order to remain faithful to God's call upon our lives. So Moses hears the call of God and responds appropriately, as Pastor Ken pointed out last week, he does it right this time. And so one would assume that since he's doing it the way God told him to do it, it would be smooth sailing from there on out, right? Unfortunately, no. Moses learned pretty quickly that simply because God calls us to something does not mean that we are thereby excluded from challenges and difficulties and problems. And from the get-go, Moses bumps up against some big challenges. He manages to get an audience with Pharaoh, the dictator of Egypt, the one who holds all power. And he says to him quite clearly, the God of Israel has sent me and has commanded you to let my people go. And the response he gets from Pharaoh is, who do you think you are? And who is this God that you're talking about? The only thing that he managed to do at the start was make Pharaoh angry. So angry, in fact, that he made life even more difficult for the Israelites who were already laboring under horrible horrible conditions. You see, one of their primary tasks was to make bricks for the kingdom of Pharaoh. Bricks at that time were made of clay and straw. Put them together, bake them, you got your brick. And the Pharaoh provided all of the straw that they would need to make these thousands, if not millions of bricks. But when Moses came in, as the so-called savior of his people and begins making demands upon Pharaoh, Pharaoh hits the roof and says, here's what you're going to get for your trouble, buddy. Your people are going to have to continue to make bricks, but they're not getting any straw from me. They're going to have to go find their own straw, but they have to meet the same quotas. And if they fail to meet those quotas, they're going to feel the sting of the whip. Well, overnight, uh, in the opinion polls, Moses goes from savior to loser. (laughs) Thanks a lot, Moses. Mr. Big Shot, you had to go in there and run your mouth to Pharaoh, and now life is worse than ever. What were you thinking? No wonder he went before God. We read in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. He goes before God. He says, Lord, You're bringing trouble upon your people. Is this why you called me here? So that I can make a fool out of myself and make more trouble for your people? And Pharaoh isn't any closer to letting anybody go anywhere. This situation has gone from bad to worse. Is this what this is all about? Moses is learning firsthand the lesson that we all need to learn about difficulties and challenges. And that is, They go hand in hand with a call. The two always come together. Challenge is simply part of the territory. I would go so far as to say that if you presently are responding to God's call, or at least you think you are, and you're not dealing with any sort of challenges, any sort of difficulties, I I would question the authenticity of your call. It just does not work that way. Call brings challenge. Now, why is that? Well, it's no mystery. God has an enemy. The spiritual forces of darkness are arrayed against our God, and they are opposed to everything that he is about. His will, his plan, his kingdom, and they're doing everything they can to thwart that from happening. And when we align ourselves with God and respond to his call, we then have an enemy. We have essentially put a big bullseye on our back. Prior to that, the devil isn't worried about us because we're neutral. But the moment we take up God's banner, we've identified ourselves 
and trouble is going to come our way. This is a broken world that we live in. And the ways of this world are opposed to the ways of God. And when the two meet, there will always be challenges. It's just part of the package. And none of us are exempt. Any of us who respond to God's call are susceptible to these challenges. And our enemy is going to go after anything that he can. Nothing is off limits. Any area of our lives that he can mess with to thwart God's plans and purposes, you can bet he's going to do it. Over the years of our married life, uh, from time to time, a handful of people have approached my wife, Becky, a handful of ladies, I should say, have approached Becky and said something like, it must be so wonderful to be married to Pastor Dan. (laughs) He is so godly and wise and kind. I bet you two just have an amazing marriage. You know, I I had considered the possibility of allowing Becky to come up here and speak to that. (laughs) But after seeing the gleam in her eye, I, I thought better of it. The fact is, we do have a good marriage. But it has not been easy, not by any stretch of the imagination. Just because I'm a pastor and she's a pastor's wife does not somehow give us a pass. We have both made the decision to answer God's call in our lives and therefore we have made ourselves a target and the enemy comes after us just like he does everybody else. And we can say and do mean things to each other And we can be unkind and impatient and get frustrated with each other and discourage one another and fight and argue. And yes, there have been those days when each of us have wanted to quit. Making the decision to step into God's will to answer his call does not guarantee a smooth road. It guarantees a challenging road. And Becky and I have encountered that in our lives. And just for the record, living with me is no picnic. Now, perhaps you're thinking to yourself, PD, I thought this was a message about call. I didn't know it was one about marriage. But here's the thing. Marriage is a call. From from the moment you say, I do, You are called by God to honor your vows, to live them out according to his plan. It is very much a call upon your life. And the sooner we come to grips with the fact that a call is going to bring challenge, the better off we're going to be in mind, in heart, and in moving forward. There is no room for naivete. There's no room here for wishful thinking. There's no room here for frustration over the fact that things aren't the way they ought to be. They aren't. They're not going to be until Jesus comes back. And I can't tell you the number of folks that I have met with in my office who have gotten stuck over the fact that things aren't the way they ought to be. Life isn't fair. And that's where they want to live. And they never make any progress. They never move forward in answering God's call because they're hung up on the fact that things are hard. Call brings a challenge. And if we're going to answer this call successfully, we need to acknowledge that. The mark of maturity in a Christian is the ability not only to understand this truth, but to accept it, own it. And by the grace of God and through his love and wisdom and strength, keep moving forward. If we're going to answer the call successfully, the first thing we need to understand is that challenges will be on the way. Now, if I had been Moses and God appeared to me in a burning bush and spoke to me audibly and performed a couple of miracles in my presence as he did for Moses. 
and then asked me to do something like free the Israelites from the most powerful nation in the world, I believe my response would have been something like, well, God, you seem to have your act together. Why don't you just have at it, big fella? No point in getting me all tangled up in this mess. What can I bring to the table? And Moses more or less did say something like that. But God doesn't go for that because God doesn't work solo. When we respond to the call of God, his expectation is we are going to join him. That there will be something for us to do. And he insisted that Moses stay in the game. There were times Moses wanted to back out, but God hemmed him in and kept pushing him in, requiring to the point that it, it almost seems as though had Moses not been involved, things wouldn't have turned out the way that they did. That's how central Moses' participation is to the whole thing. And if the call upon your life is going to come to fruition, you've got to get in the game. You can't just sit back and expect God to do it for you. Unfortunately, when most of us bump up against challenges, our response is typically either fight or flight. On the one hand, we're either going to take it on all by ourselves and beat the problem into submission and do it in our flesh, or we're going to get as far away as fast as we possibly can. But God's not interested in either of those options. Last week, Pastor Ken made clear, doing it on our own never, ever works. It is a guaranteed setup for failure. We don't have what it takes to answer a God-sized call. But neither is running an option either. Moses is never given that option to just turn tail and get out of there. That definitely isn't going to accomplish anything. Instead, what Moses had to learn was the principle of the division of labor. The division of labor. There are some things that only God can do, and then there are some things that only we can do. And part of the adventure of discovering God's will for our lives is discovering, God, what is going to be your part and what is going to be my part? And let's work together to make it happen. When Becky and I have bumped up against challenges in our marriage, my typical response has been flight. Not literal departure, I haven't left, but an unwillingness to engage with the issue. Just sort of hoping against hope it would go away. Ignore it. But of course, as I learn every single time, to ignore is to make worse and to make bigger and badder. And things only change. Only way challenges are successfully dealt with in our marriage is when we both recognize we've got to be engaged and we've got to be engaged with God. There's going to be something that only he can do, but there's going to be something that only we can do. And sometimes as we have sought to overcome marital challenges, God's direction has been go to counseling. Go to counseling. Go talk to somebody wiser, smarter than you about this whole marriage thing. I will work through them to heal you. I'm always astonished at people who are resistant, if not downright defiant, about going to counseling. It really makes no sense to me. You're dealing with something that you don't have the capacity to solve. But you're not going to go talk to someone who can help you, even if that's how God has directed you? In my research for this message, I actually came across a, a psychological term, a technical term for those individuals who are resistant to going to counseling. It's called stupid. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it. And God has done good things in our marriage through counselors, and I'm sure he will again in the future. If we need help, 
we go. And you should too. Sometimes God works through another couple, a husband and wife who are a little further down the road than we are. And we can go out to dinner with them or have coffee with them and glean from their wisdom. And sometimes our cooperation with God simply leads us to a place of repentance, of confessing our sin to him and to each other and forgiving and getting on with it. The bottom line is this, the only time things change, the only time challenges are overcome is when we work with God. I have to think in a room this size, there are any number of people who even today have heard a call from God, but the challenges are daunting, even fearful. Maybe, just maybe, God has been calling you to start a new business. A business that is going to bring glory to him and bless other people through your kindness and generosity. But you're terrified. And part of you wants to just go out and tackle it and kill it all on your own. And part of you wants to run away. But God says, let's don't do either one. Let's work together and make it happen. Maybe some of you today are being called to deal with an addiction. You've been pretending far too long like it isn't there, but it's killing you and it's killing your family. And trust me, willpower and good intentions are worthless in the face of an addiction. Perhaps God is calling you to find a counselor, a support group, some means that you may not have considered by which he can facilitate healing in your life and enable you to overcome that challenge. Maybe for some of us, the call is as simple today as going and apologizing to someone. But the challenge is a mountain of pride. It wasn't my fault. I shouldn't have to do it this time. It's her turn. It's his turn. Maybe what you need to do is just get on your knees and say, Lord, my pride is killing me. Please forgive me and give me grace to go and do what I need to do. Say I'm sorry. Big or small, God wants to be involved and he wants us to be involved so that we can move forward together. When we answer God's call, we need to understand there's going to be challenges. No two ways about it. We need to understand that there is going to be something for us to do. Neither doing it on our own nor sitting back and letting God do it all, but rather working together. And then finally, we learn from the life of Moses that there is something that we need to believe. And what we need to believe is that God is for us. We need to believe that because everything about this world communicates that he isn't. This world, world is hell-bent on persuading us that God doesn't care anything about us and that he's forgotten us and abandoned us. And if anything, the challenges only prove that he's forgotten us. But it takes courage and it takes faith to believe that God is for us. And Moses even in the face of criticism, even at the possible cost of his life, chose to believe God is for me, God is for the Israelites. And he moved forward. And God proved faithful. God came through. But he did so in the most unimaginable way. In a way that no one had ever thought of and their wildest dreams considered that he might do. God had been hammering away at the Egyptians, sending plague after plague, decimating the nation. But Pharaoh was hard-hearted, not going to let those people go. And finally, God called together Moses and the leaders of the Israelites, and he said, okay, 
here's what's going to happen tonight. Judgment is going to fall. And the firstborn, human or animal, that is not protected will die. Protected? Protected with what? God said, I want every family to take a lamb, spotless and without defect, and to sacrifice that lamb. And as a sign to me that you have sacrificed that lamb, you are to paint the blood of the lamb on your doorposts and over your door. And when judgment comes, I will pass over your home and no one in your home will die. God's idea was the Passover. Judgment was coming. Death was coming, and not just for the Egyptians. It was coming for the Jews too. You see, God's judgment didn't have anything to do with ethnicity, but it had everything to do with sin, and Egyptians and Jews alike were sinners. That's why God was so explicit in saying, you've got to have blood over you to protect you or you will die too. He wasn't picking on the Egyptians. No, he was rendering just and righteous judgment on the sinfulness of humanity. And just as God said, it came to pass. And all of those who were under the blood of the spotless lamb were delivered, were saved. But those who were not experienced loss of the worst kind. And that night, Moses and the Israelites learned God is for us. Because that very night, Pharaoh called for Moses and said, get out. Leave, all of you, tonight. Leave my country. And after 400 years of slavery, and cruelty and genocide, the Israelites finally took their first steps toward freedom. They learned God is for us. And we need to learn that same lesson, that God is for us. Especially when we bump up against those challenges that are knocking us down. We need to know God is for us. And I can say to you, friends, without reservation, without hesitation, He is. And the reason I can say it with confidence is because God has already dealt with the greatest challenge that you and I will ever face. Nothing compares. He's already solved our biggest problem. The problem of judgment and death. You see, each one of us are sinners, just like the Egyptians and the Jews. Each one of us have separated ourselves from God, the very source of life, and we stand under the judgment of death. And we are helpless to do anything about it. Every bit as helpless as Moses was before the Pharaoh. We can't do anything to solve our own problem. But just as God made provision for the Israelites, so he has made provision for us. In the Gospel of John, when John the Baptist sees Jesus for the very first time, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John understood. This is the one who will come and deal with our sin. The blood of lambs merely covered over our sin. Those lambs were merely pointers to the lamb, the spotless lamb of God, the one without defect, without sin, apart from whose blood no one could be saved. And then in John chapter 13, in an instance of God's perfect timing that only God could pull off. When did Jesus walk into Jerusalem to lay down his life? Passover. 
the week of Passover, which had been celebrated for 1,400 years, culminating with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shedding his blood for you and for me. And for all of us who put ourselves under his blood, who accept his sacrifice on our behalf, who find shelter and harbor in him, judge, judgment and death pass over us because he has taken it for us. If you're serious about answering God's call, challenges are going to come, big and small. Do you understand that they're going to be there? Are you willing to engage with God and do something about it? And do you believe that God is for you? Does the cross communicate to you above all else, God is for you? me. Just a moment. I want us to pray together. And, and, and I want to pray for the, the two groups that I mentioned at the beginning of the message. For, I, I want to pray for those who haven't responded to the general call of God, who have yet to step into that relationship with him. But I also want to pray for those of us who have made that decision but we're having difficulty responding to another call, a specific call. I have to think, again, in a room this size, God is touching someone and saying to them, this is what I want you to do. But deep in your heart, you're thinking, I just don't know. The cross says yes. We're going to pray, and after we've spent time praying, we're going to sing one last song, and I'm going to ask you, out of respect for those around you, and out of your love for the Lord, not to run to the doors, but rather to remember this is a holy moment of worship, not lasting that long. We need everyone worshiping together. Let's pray. Father, first of all, I want to pray for anyone here who perhaps for the first time has realized, oh my goodness, the lamb, the perfect lamb of God gave his life for me. And I have nothing to fear and everything to gain. I pray, Lord, they would open their hearts to you, receive your forgiveness and step into that abundant eternal life that is only found in you. And then I pray, Lord, for those of us who've already made that decision but now found ourselves facing a challenge, big or small. I pray, oh God, the cross would be for us the great reminder that you are for us and there is no challenge any of us will face that is bigger than the one you have already solved our salvation. Encourage us, strengthen us, I pray. Give us the grace we need to answer your call. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.